A little less well known is the tragic story of Irena Asher. She was a 25 year old model and teacher in training at the time, living in Ponsonby, Auckland, New Zealand. On October 10th, 2004, Asher and three friends, including her new boyfriend and two others, travelled to Piha, West Auckland. They drank at bars and smoked some weed. Arena's behaviour became increasingly unusual. She climbed up a tree and back down, and then immediately made for the beach, where she waded through waist-aligned deep water. A couple described her as in her own world. Later that night, she was reportedly dancing naked with her boyfriend in a house, and at 8pm told him to go home for an unknown reason. He did as she asked. At 8.55pm, Irena grabbed her phone from the kitchen table, hurried outside and made a triple one emergency call to the police communications centre. Three calls occurred from 8.55 to 9.11pm. Throughout the calls, Irena spoke of a scary man who tried to pressure her into sex, later leading police to be suspicious of her boyfriend. She also said that they've given me drugs and stuff as well. The police thought it best to just call a taxi for her, as they didn't see it necessary to send officers out. Arena had hung up after the last call, and no further contact could be made to the phone. It appeared as if the phone was disconnected. The taxi the police called for her mistakenly went to the wrong location. So, with no one there to pick her up, she began walking away from the house. Between 9.20 and 9.30pm, Irena was walking down Piha Road when Julia Woodhouse and her son Henry Woodhouse were driving and saw Irena. She looked stressed and was wearing barely any clothes on quite a cold night, so they checked to see if she was alright. Irena told them that she had been kidnapped. They said they'd help, and they took Irena to their home. Apparently, they didn't call the police because Irena was adamant that they call no one. Despite her having called the police about half an hour earlier, Mr. and Miss Woodhouse both suspected that Irena was under the influence of alcohol and drugs. During the four hours she spent with the family, Irena told Henry Woodhouse that people had taken pictures of her without her permission. This definitely could be true, as she was dancing naked earlier. Henry had agreed to sleep in the living room with Irena until morning. However, at 1pm, she had suddenly got out of bed and quickly fled outside. She dropped the gown that the Woodhouses gave her in the middle of the street, but kept running into the night, completely naked. Henry tried running after her and later, Julia also tried searching, but they didn't find her. So, they alerted the police. This time, the police sent a car immediately, and a search was conducted. This is where it gets even weirder, and Irena's behaviour is increasingly bizarre. Around the same time, a couple, Mr. Nixon and Miss Ross, walked to their dog along Garden Road, when they spotted the naked Arena. She was seen saluting the street light pole, and at one point had her arms in the air. She also knelt and kissed the ground. Arena then continued to walk down Seaview Road, heading towards Piha Beach. The couple followed her. Mr. Nixon reportedly shone a flashlight towards the beach, where she was headed. He saw nothing. That was the last time anyone had seen Irena Asher. Her body was never recovered. An important note is that Irena was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and had a history of manic episodes. Some speculate that Irena had fallen victim to a psychotic episode. Symptoms include hallucination, delusion, insomnia, paranoia and inattention. Some people are more likely to experience psychosis, and the risk is higher when marijuana is taken. 
many suspect that she had ran into the beach and drowned that night. The alternate theory is that she was in genuine danger and someone or a group of people were trying to kidnap her. Perhaps it was a combination of both theories that led to her disappearance. Whatever way you look at it, this case is very unfortunate, and a harrowing reminder to always be too careful when you're out drinking and partying under the cold blanket of the night. Logan Schindelman was a 19-year-old high school graduate who had left college after one year to work odd jobs around the area where he lived, in Tumwater, Washington. In high school, he was a star football player with decent grades and a seemingly bright future ahead of him. Around the time of his disappearance, it appears that Logan was going through an identity crisis. He never knew his Saudi Arabian father who had left the US before Logan was ever born, and he had recently contacted his aunt, Tina Crary, in order to try and understand who he was. He also cut ties with his high school friends, and was unable to make new ones in college. His grandmother, Ginny Gibo, who had raised Logan herself through elementary and high school, revealed he had taken up smoking marijuana. This could have something to do with Logan's strange behaviour leading up to and during his disappearance. What strange behaviour, you ask? Well, on the morning of May 19, 2016, Logan had a rather unusual chat with his grandmother as they were both getting ready for work. Logan confessed that he had an epiphany and that he'd been driving around early in the morning. Ginny told him that they'd talk about it more in the evening and then left for work. That evening, Logan hadn't returned home. Ginny tracked Logan's phone and discovered that it had pinged near Olympia. She just assumed Logan had visited his mother, who was living in Olympia at the time. Turns out, Logan had never actually visited his mother. Activity on his phone showed that he went south down the I-5, then north down the I-5, and then back south again. He hadn't returned home the following day, so Ginny tried to report him missing, but the Thurston County Police Department was closed for some reason, so she reported him missing on Monday the 23rd. Upon a little investigating, the police found out his car had been impounded on the 20th. His black 1996 Chrysler Sebring was found at mile post 92 along southbound Interstate 5 between Tumwater in Maytown. His cell phone, some bags of food and wallet, including identification, debit card and $25 in cash, were found in the vehicle, but not Logan. What was he doing that day? A woman driving on the same road that morning said that she had seen Logan with two other Caucasian men standing toward the back of his car, which was parked near exit 95. When she returned home along the same route after work, the car was in the same position, except this time with its hood up. A police sketch of one of the men was given to the public. At around 2pm, three people witnessed Logan's car drift across three lanes on Interstate 5 and hitting the concrete barrier at the centre divider near milepost 92, where the car was later discovered. The car was apparently seen with no driver at the time, However, a Caucasian man with red or brown hair was seen dashing away from the passenger side and into the nearby woods. In the evening of that day, there was a sighting of a naked teenager that could have been Logan, although this is not confirmed. He couldn't be located by police who searched for him with dogs. That's pretty much where the trail ends. With such an unusual case, many theories have surfaced such as that Logan's half-sister's boyfriend who moved in had something to do with it. They didn't really get along. Some rumours speculate that they argued and maybe even fought. A polygraph test proved that the boyfriend did not have anything to do with the disappearance. But polygraph tests are notoriously unreliable. 
Another theory is that Logan had graduated from weed to harder drugs, and had run into some trouble with whoever was supplying drugs to him. Some even go as far as to speculate that he was a drug trafficker who had wronged some bad people, although there is no clear indication of this. Logan's case is strikingly different from your average missing persons case. Many questions still remain. Why did he go driving early in the morning? What was his epiphany, and was it relevant to his disappearance? Why did he drive back and forth along the I-5? Why did he leave his wallet and phone in the car? Who was the man the truck driver saw fleeing his abandoned car? The absurdity of this case is summed up well by a statement from Detective Frank Frawley. I have no reason to believe he's been killed. I have no reason to believe he's alive. Michael Anthony McLean was an educated man with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Hesse College and had a seemingly pleasant life, working for a non-profit organisation that provides resources for veterans, senior citizens and people with disabilities called Easter Seals, New Hampshire. A resident of Manchester, New Hampshire, McLean and some friends travelled to Nashua, New Hampshire and visited the Tropical Lounge on Hollis Street on the night of April 20th, 2019, and early morning of the 21st. On the surface, it seemed like a regular fun night, drinking and partying. An altercation broke out between an acquaintance of McLean's and another woman. McLean supposedly intervened and attempted to de-escalate the situation, although whether or not he did actually intervene is questioned. The incident didn't fully reach a close until 1.45am, when police arrived on scene. Upon the disbursement of the crowd, McLean had for some reason decided not to return to the nightclub, and had walked off down West Hollis Street, and was seen via CCTV walking onto Eldridge Street. He then proceeded walking towards a McDonald's, where a car with people he knew saw McLean. McLean reportedly had also seen them. They stated McLean did not seem distressed, and appeared to be waiting for a ride. The last time his phone pinged was 2am at the 24-hour McDonald's on East Hollis Street. After that, he walked all the way up to Riverfront Landing Apartment Complex on 11 Bancroft Street where footage captured McLean entering and exiting the complex's parking garage at 3.23am. This is where McLean was seen for the very last time. Because of the apartment complex's proximity to the Merrimack River, many believe he had accidentally drowned that night. Case closed, right? Well, not exactly. There are a few details I neglected to mention before, such as, somewhere between his journey from the jungle lounge to the McDonald's, he made a call to his boss, who he was fairly close to, and stated, They're after me. More than one. She tried to call him back after that, but to no avail. He also sent three texts to his neighbour that are believed to have been sent via speech-to-text dictation. Help, lol, our. What stood aloof? and Eldridge, bro. This is what puts an entirely different perspective on the matter, and points to Michael being in danger that night, from an unknown person or persons. Perhaps his possible drowning was not accidental, or perhaps he never even drowned at all, as his body was never discovered. Lieutenant Patrick Hennon of the Nashua Police stated that foul play is not suspected, and believes he had accidentally drowned in the river. This is logical, as he had been drinking and he seemed fine when his acquaintances in the car had drove by him along East Hollis Street, and he didn't seem obviously distressed in any of the camera footage. However, the fact still remains that he clearly proclaimed to be in danger that night. The question is, from who? Why did he even decide to walk to the McDonald's or the apartment complex? If he was in distress, 
why not tell his acquaintances driving down East Hollis Street? Perhaps one day some piece of evidence may be discovered, and will shed light onto a very peculiar missing persons case.